We are extremely grateful to Heidi Alexander and Belinda Brooks for leading this session. Heidi and, Ale um, Heidi and Belinda are from John Grant School, which is part of our East Coast Hub. And our East Coast Hub is a group of eight special schools in the Norfolk, Suffolk region. Um, so I'll hand over to Heidi and Belinda in a second. Just sorry to be boring a little bit bossy. Um, I just want to go through some house rules just quickly, just to make sure that the session runs as smoothly as possible. Um, so I can see that a lot of you have started to introduce yourselves in the chat already. So thank you very much for doing that. That's fantastic. If you haven't done that already, please do introduce yourself. Just say what school you're from and if there's anything in particular you'd like to get out of the session as well. Um, the chat function is the little speech bubble up in the top right hand corner of your screen. Um, there should be time throughout the presentation for questions, so kind of natural pauses throughout the presentation. And I know that Heidi and Belinda have put in some time at the end for questions as well. Um, but please do use the chat function to record any questions or any thoughts that you may have, either for Heidi and Belinda or for the wider group as well. Um, I can see that I think you're all muted, which is fantastic. Thank you for doing that. Um, again, please do remain muted throughout. It just prevents background noise from interrupting the presentation. There may be opportunities to ask follow up questions. So if you do need to unmute, um, just press control plus D um, or just hover over the little microphone at the bottom of your screen. Um, at the end of the presentation, I'll come back to give you a bit of information on what Challenge Partners is doing at the moment to support schools. Um, and then we'll also be inviting any non-partner schools from the Norfolk, Suffolk area, um, just to stay for a quick 30 minute intro to Challenge Partners. Um, and Sally Garrett will be joining us for that and she's the senior partner of that hub. Um, I'll also send around a feedback form as well, so I'll put that in the chat at the end and I will send a follow up email after this as well with various links in. We'd be really, really grateful if you could fill out that form. Um, feedback is really, really valuable to us and it really does help us uh, help to sort of guide and shape our future events. Um, when I send an email after this, I will attach the slides as a PDF as well. And the final thing for me, just to let you know that this session is being recorded. Um, we'll obviously sort of crop out the, the very beginning bit when everyone was joining. Um, if for any reason you, you don't want to feature on this recording at all, then please do just let me know. Um, I don't know if you've seen these recorded before, but it's normally just the presentation and whoever's speaking that's, that's on the recording anyway. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Heidi and Belinda. So I'm going to stop presenting my screen and hopefully theirs will come up shortly. Okay, hopefully everyone can see our screen now in our presentation. Can you put your thumbs up if you can see what we can see here? Brilliant. Oh, the joys of technology. We're quite new to this. So, um, yeah, I'm hoping that um, everyone will get something from this. So we understand that there's a huge amount of people in here, which is a little bit terrifying. Um, but uh, from all walks, from mainstream and from special. So um, if you do work in a special setting, there may be um, some things here that you've heard of before. Um, but hopefully you pick up some new information as well. Um, and for those who are complete novices to sensory um, processing and sensory integration, this hopefully will give you a bit of an introduction about what it's all about. Um, so if I click on the next screen. Um, so just first of all, to introduce ourselves, uh, my name's Heidi Alexander. Um, I've been teaching uh, children with autism in particular for the last sort of, 15 years. Um, and I started work over in Kent, um, where I started working with an amazing um, occupational therapist. Uh, and really at that stage, sensory integration and sensory processing was really in its infancy. Um, so I worked quite closely with her to, um, to put together some strategies to use in school um, with the, the young people that we had who were clearly you know, experiencing difficulties around sensory processing. Um, then moved over to Suffolk and now to Norfolk. Um, so really it, it, I've, I've kind of gone from um, uh, really at the first stages of sensory processing and the idea of it through to now having some proper things established within school which has been really effective. Um, I also completed uh, my MA in autism and um, was an advanced skills teacher in autism as well so I've got quite a bit of background particularly around autism. But, okay and um, so I have worked at John Grant School for about 12 years now um, so and I was fortunate enough to be involved um, in setting up um, a, a discrete autism provision here. Prior to that, um, this is a complex needs school, so prior to that, um, pupils with um, kind of severe autism um, for whom that impacted 
significantly on their learning. We're actually based in within the main mainstream parts of school. Um, and that, that brought with it um, challenges for both um, those youngsters and the youngsters that they shared um, the classroom with. So um, about eight years ago, we made the decision to um, develop a, a specialist provision for, for pupils with autism. Um, and that started off with a secondary provision. Um, in the one, we now have a post-16 one. So we're fortunate that we have um, a really well-established provision that we can kind of um, see the youngsters right through. Sometimes they go out into the main part of the school after a period of time. Um, but one of the things that we kind of recognised um, and when Heidi joined us what, about four years ago yeah, yeah. Um, is, is that we were struggling um, to meet the, the sensory needs of some of the youngsters um, because part of it, and part of that was because our occupational therapist had such a massive caseload and mm. um, that she was really only able to kind of be involved with those very high level youngsters um, and one thing we would say this um, this kind of profiling and things is not for um, those youngsters that are kind of displaying really self-injurious behaviour or really significant issues. Obviously, um, we're not occupational therapists and we wouldn't, we wouldn't ever pretend to be. We would, those are the, that's the point at which you should be seeking um, professional input. Um, so what Heidi brought with her is this kind of toolkit that we've, we've really kind of integrated into both our ASC provision and the wider, wider provision for youngsters throughout the school. So um, obviously we'll explain how it works um, as we get into it. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, we've kind of covered the aims of the session um, to further develop um, an understanding of sensory processing disorder. Obviously, like Heidi said, we understand that people um, already come with a, a wealth of knowledge and experience probably in this area. So apologies if we're, we're kind of um, repeating stuff that you're already familiar with. It's just to add, add some context for those colleagues joining us that may be less familiar. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're going to talk about um, how STD impacts people's ability to access education in our experience um, and how we've addressed that through the use of um, sensory profiling um, in order to better meet their needs um, and, it, it, you know, inevitably improve the way that they access education. Okay. okay. So just really to give you some background about uh, sensory processing and, and um, how it's sort of developed into sensory integration therapy and all that sort of thing. So um, the DSM-5 is the main tool that's used in America to, to, um, to diagnose children with autism. Um, and that came out in 2013, the, the latest edition. Um, and what was fantastic is that they included in the DSM-5 sensory processing as a main area for the autism diagnosis. So that was, that was really well received. And um, we were expecting the ICD, which is what we use um, uh, within in England, um, to diagnose, to follow suit really with the DSM-5. Um, what was interesting is that actually uh, sensory processing disorder wasn't included specifically within the definition for autism, um, which threw up quite a few problems. I mean, it was only brought out in May 2019, and it's supposed to come into effect in 2022. What it does do, though, is, is um, reference uh, repetitive and, uh, and restrictive and inflexible patterns of behaviour. And uh, I'm sure all of you know, if you're ever uh, involved in the, in the process of um, having a child diagnosed with autism, often you get questionnaires about sensory processing disorder. Um, but what this has made it quite difficult in the UK is um, access to occupational therapy support. Um, because because uh, it's not actually on the diagnosis, you can't automatically say this child has autism. He needs sensory integration. Um, so, but and another reason why it's so important to use um, strategies and, and toolkits like we're explaining today, um, because then we can plug those gaps. Because we know that um, I mean the research shows that 95% of um, people with autism will have some sort of sensory processing difficulties. Um, so these these issues have to be addressed. Um, a lead uh, researcher in the field, and um, you've probably heard of Simon Baron Cohn, um, and uh, I mean he was he was quite vocal about the fact that it wasn't included in the um, ICD, um, and he said that uh, sensory issues may well be nearly u uh, universal in autism, and if this is true, we we should count it as a core symptom um, within the umbrella category. So um, yeah, there's there's been quite a lot quite a lot of debate around the ICD, but you know that's what we have here now. Um, but I think it's fair to say that if you have a child with autism within your provision, that child is likely to have sensory processing difficulties, um, which need to be addressed in order them to, for their own well-being and to access education. Um, 
So uh, sensory integration um, is is a is a, a recognised therapy. It was um, also thought of really in nineteen fifties by a lady called Dr. J uh, Jane Ayres, um, and it's sort of evolved from there. Um, we we're claiming we're, we're going to say now this isn't sensory integration that we're talking about um, because, like I say, sensory integration is a therapy and we're not therapists. Um, so we're attacking this from like a professional um, educational point of view. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, okay. Okay, so sensory processing. Okay, so these are all the different sensory um, processing systems. I'm not going to go through all of them because obviously you know, everybody knows what visual and tactile and things like that are. Um, but there are a few on there that you probably don't recognize or if you do, probably don't know a huge amount about. Uh, so the vestibular and the proprioceptive systems we'll be looking at particularly because they're um, quite unique and also, which I always pronounce wrong, interoception. Interoception, yes, yes, So, uh, which is quite a new area. So um, we'll be going through that and explaining what that is as well. Um, basically, sensory processing is, is an innate ability that um, uh, a normal functioning child as a baby um, develop. So, for example, me sitting on this chair, I'm, I'm processing a huge amount of sensory information. So um, I know that my feet are on the floor. Um, I'm using my visual system and processing all the lights that are in the room and the, and the screen in front of me. I'm using my auditory system because um, there's noises outside that I can hear and I'm processing that. Um, I'm processing that I can sit straight on a chair. Um, so all these systems are being used. Uh, yeah, my tactile system, my bottom's on the chair, for example. So all that information is coming in and I'm able to process that and still speak to you um, now. Um, so for a child with autism um, who, or a child who has sensory um, processing issues, if you think one of those things is un unaligned or they have difficulty with, how difficult just sitting here would be and, and to be able to speak. So for example, if my visual system was off um, and I was just focusing on the lights all the time, um, that would be incredibly difficult. Or if um, my tactile system was off and I didn't know my bottom was touching the chair, I'd be falling off the chair. So um, that's kind of what, 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 it, what it's about, really. Um, and when we do talk about these sensory processing systems, some of them, some of the behaviours um, that you may see can be caused by a range of different processes being off. So, for example, um, if you've got a child who eats um, things which aren't edible, um, that could be for a range of reasons. And hopefully when we talk about the profile um, a bit later, it's a, then you're able to unpick why that is happening. So, for, for example, for a child eating an edible object, um, it might be a tactile thing, that they like the feel of whatever it is, is that's in their mouth. Um, it might be a gustatory thing, so they, the taste. Um, or it might be um, introspection, which we'll talk about later, which is about um, how it feels internally within your body. Um, so it is a really complex thing. It, it's not a matter of saying, oh, yeah. Um, so hopefully, as we go through the questionnaire and the profile and nothing else, you'll have an idea of how to unpick these different areas. Heidi and Belinda, sorry, can I just jump in quickly? Um, there's a few people saying they can no longer see the slides for some reason. I was wondering oh, yeah. if you could... <laughs> it's odd because I, I can see them. I, I don't know if everyone else can't see them. Ah, okay, so maybe change layout. Um, could everyone maybe just check that they've got the right layout? So if you go onto the three dots in the bottom right-hand corner, you should be able to change the layout, and then one of them should be should be showing the slides. That would be great. Sorry, I thought if, if nobody could see them, maybe if you yeah, represented yeah. them, but if people can see them, then I think it must be uh, people's layout. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you. Thank you. We know. Is that better for people? I'll give us a minute. Yeah. Um, and just sorry, I've, I've also no, I've noticed now how to scroll to the bottom of the chat, so I didn't actually <laughs> realise um, anyone was there uh, saying things. So can is the microphone okay? It's because we're running off too. So if you can hear okay, um, if anyone really can't hear, I'm I'm not sure. There's a great deal we can do about yeah. it. I could possibly move nearer to the microphone. Yeah. Back a bit. And then they were just oh, okay. the choice of technology. Are we good to go? Is that okay? Lovely. Thank Lovely. you. Thank you. I just wanted to touch very briefly. Um, sensory modulation is a phrase that's often associated with sensory processing. Um, it just to kind of very briefly um, explain kind of what it is for people that don't know. So that's um, obviously effective sensory processing. It relies on the brain's ability to correct correctly process and modulate um, sensory input, sensory information. 
Um, so the modulation works alongside the processing and essentially it's about um, prioritizing and filtering out. So um, when sensory modulation is, is working fine, it allows us to kind of filter out the unimportant info. Mm -hmm. um, so in this instance, it allows me to filter out kind of the, the um, gardening work that's going out outside, people walking past in the co corridor and all that kind of thing. It allows me to concentrate on what I'm doing. Um, when that's off off balance, um, we can often see um, that's when we see difficulty. So mm -hmm. youngsters or, or pupils will find it difficult to attend to a task. They'll find it difficult to prioritise um, kind of what they're doing um, and that kind of thing. So I just wanted to briefly mention it because it will come up in some of the texts that we reference and those kind mm -hmm. of things. Um, and often, sent, you know, issues around sensory modulation is where we see hypo or hypo sensitivity, particularly in um, and again, I'm, I'm aware that most people are probably familiar with um, the terms hypo or hypo, um, but if they're not, um, so hypersensitivity um, is when, you know, the, the response to sensory input is, is too acute, it's um, kind of over-responsive, um, and hyposensitivity is kind of the opposite of that. Now, um, interestingly, and to keep us on our toes, often youngsters can present with, um, with both. Um, hyper and mm. hypo sensitivity and that can change depending on the day of the week the you know the environment and all those kind of things and again the, the questionnaire and the profiling that we use is helps to identify to unpick things and identify kind of just which particular areas are likely to be difficult um so just an example if somebody's um you know got visual hypersensitivity um they might um you know be really distracted by little particles of dust um, so, you know, showing in the sunlight through the window, um, they might flap them to watch them move and those kind of things. Whereas if they're hypersensitive, um, they might be seeking um, sort of bright lights really close to their eyes, be very distracted um, if there are lights um, in the room or if it, you know it's shining through the window in a particular way. Um, so again, it's you know, it, we often we'll say, oh, it's got visual, you know, something's going on visually. Um, but what's important to recognise is, you know, what's the, what's the purpose of that behaviour? Are they um, are they avoiding that input, or are they are they actively seeking it? And again, um, the, the profiling tools that we use helps us to identify that. Yeah, okay. um, and also just to make it even more complicated is that we we do find that a lot of our children in mainstream and and in um, special needs settings, um, this can fluctuate. So you might notice some days he's having more of a, a sensitive days than others. Um, uh, a typical example um, would be I, I taught a young man who um, had self-injurious behaviour because he was very sensitive to sound um, and some days he would come in and there'd be noise in the classroom, noise outside and he'd be absolutely fine with it. Other days he'd come in with his hands over his ears and I knew, okay, we're having one of those days where it's, it's, it's particularly sensitive and that might be due to tiredness, not feeling well, uh, the weather anything like that so these fluctuations can be caused by external factors as well um so for example for that young man um he came into school with his hands over his ears um he was very rigid with his routine and we did a sensory circuit outside um and as we were walking to the outside area i could hear uh, roadworks outside and you can imagine just thinking oh i'm either going to have to change his routine which will cause a huge amount of upsets or I know very well that as soon as we get outside, he's going to be incredibly upset by the noise. Um, and this is the difficulty we find ourselves, particularly around autism as well, is, is when you put these supports in, in place, you're, you're balancing the other needs as well, if that makes sense. So, I mean, in that example, I had no choice. I gave him the option. I said, you know, we, if we go outside, there's going to be noise and you could go back to class. But he was persistent that he was going to go out. And of course, we had a meltdown. Um, so although these strategies work beautifully, there are times like that that you can't predict what, what the outcome will be. Um, but it's just being aware um, that those sensitivities have a huge impact on these young people's lives um, and, and can result in difficult or very dangerous behaviour in, in all settings. OK. OK, so proprioception. <clears throat> Uh, the easiest way of understanding the proprioceptive system is um, based on body awareness and pressure. Um, they're the big things, really. So um, an example of me using my proprioceptive system now would be knowing how far away Belinda is from myself. So if I gesture, I know I'm not going to hit her in the face. 
not on purpose, not on purpose. Not on purpose. <laughs> yeah, so, so I can gesture, you know, and, and I can move around and I know exactly where I am within this room. Um, so somebody who has difficulty with that, they might be what you would call a room hugger. So as they come into a room, they like to touch everything around the space or they'll, they'll circle around the room. Um, and what they're doing is, is processing where everything is and where they are within that room. Um, so if you think about how, how kind of scary that would be if your processive system um, of body awareness was off, you wouldn't know where your hands and feet end. So you, um, those children might be um, tapping their feet constantly to work out where their feet were, um, be fiddling with things or tapping desks and things. So they're, 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 they're processing by um, seeking where their hands and feet are and where their body is within a room. Um, also pressure, which is a massive thing. So um, I've got my can of Red Bull here, which I've got to put on our screen. But So for example, if I've got my can of drink here, um, for my proprioceptive system, I know that by picking up the drink, how much pressure to use not to crush the can, um, not to drop it. So I'm processing how much pressure I need to use to pick this up. But I'm also using my body awareness of knowing where that can is. So I'm not just locking it down with my hand um, and not, not reaching it. Um, and it, it's, it's once you realise what children do in order to try and meet these needs that you realise why children are crashers and bangers. Um, so if they get bikes and ram them into walls um, or use too much pressure with other people. So um, they might squeeze them too tightly or play too roughly. Um, and, and that might be to do with their understanding of actually how much pressure to use. So it might not be behaviour, it might more, more be their, their, their sensory system sort of overworking or not working well enough. Um, I mean, again, again, I could give an example of a young man who I'd worked with um, who we, could, we thought was it was um, dangerous behaviour. Um, he used to quite often get very irritated with other children and, and physically attack them. Um, but whenever he did it, we used to call it the hand of rage. He put his hand out before he was about to grab someone. So we kind of knew who he was going for. And actually what he was doing was working out with his proprioceptive system. That's how far away I am from that person. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's when you start picking, you think, oh, that's why he's doing that. You know, um, it didn't really help with the attacking of people, but at least, you know, we understood why that behaviour was manifesting. So, um, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, let's see. Uh, so, so other, other children, children might be uh, those who have difficulty maintaining their body position and tone. So, might be quite floppy on their seats um, or very rigid. Um, uh, they require uh, constant feedback from their body position, um, so they need to keep moving all the time. So, you know, they're getting that feedback. They, they'll enjoy things like um, using bikes and using and the swimming pool because they get loads of feedback from the water. So it's, it's, it's all to do with body, um, body awareness and pressure. So we're hoping that, um, if you don't mind, just having a little think about that, um, it may be that you can't think of anyone in your setting. Um, and if, if that's the case, then if you just think about what, sort of behaviours you might see with pressure seeking or pressure avoidance or um, poor body awareness or over awareness of your body um, and just pop into the chat um, so, some examples of how you think those sort of behaviours might manifest. It'd be really useful. Okay, if we take maybe like two, two three minutes. minutes. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so I think we're just just one person. Um, oh no, hang on, thank you. It's it's loading up now. Ah, oh, perfect. <laughs> Our yeah. computer was a bit slow. Yeah. Yeah, so one of the things we see a lot, um, um, both of us have done outreach work um, for our local mainstream um, schools, and one of the, for some reason, um, one of the real the, the real pet hates is the rocking on the chair. And often when you go, it you can you can kind of spot spot the child you're there to support or advise on. Um, very quickly because they are they are the chair rockers and they mm. sit still on your chair sit still on your chair 
Um, one thing that we, as a school, would never, you know, we're very clear about is we don't ever, we don't ever stop a child rocking on a chair because we acknowledge that if they're doing that, they're probably doing it for a good reason. What we might then do um, is be looking at um, alternative ways to input that because obviously it can be disruptive, particularly um, in a mainstream setting when you've got lots of youngsters um, in the same room and things. So um, that that is one that that often will come up. He, he constantly rocks on his chair. He keeps getting up from his, his seat and, and walking around the room and those kind of things. That's not sometimes, but it might well be um, to elicit a reaction or whatever. But often um, there will be a very good reason behind it. Um, and yeah, and a good a good way of um, that has worked really effectively with rockers on their chairs is um, I, I don't know if anybody's seen um, therabands. They're sort of um, they're used in gyms and things that stretch. Um, you can wrap those around chair legs and so actually the child can then kick against the theraband and it doesn't make so much noise and it prevents the rocking. Um, so that's that's just one strategy, but we'll go through lots of different strategies on, on how to support that. Yet you've all come up with brilliant ideas. Yeah, yeah. And again, as I was saying, sometimes these sensory systems do, um, yeah, so yeah, do, do kind of cross over. So um, for example, a, a child who's um, not too sure of uneven surfaces it may well be proprioceptive because of um, their body awareness, but it might be visual because they might their vision may be just um, straight ahead rather than down kind of thing. So um, it's, it's taking everything into account. But yeah, everyone's answered brilliantly. Yeah, the fact you've got lots of banging and crashing children. Yeah, and jumping feet children. <laughs> yes, lovely. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you. Right, the vestibular system. Um, and again, a bit like um, the proprioceptive system, the vestibular system is sometimes a bit less familiar um, to, to people. So um, essentially, that provides our brain with the information about motion, where where our head is um, in the universe, uh, mm. spatial orientation. It, it often comes um, hand in hand with um, the proprioception. They kind of, you know, can be quite mixed together. Um, and it's things like that it allows us to keep our balance. Um, you know, maintain our posture, move safely, um, and kind of move with, with purpose and correctly. Um, so it's actually, again, um, it's a little bit of interesting scientific info. So it's um, obviously the, the vestibular, vestibular system um, is controlled by the, the very small um, hairs in our ear, in your inner ear. Um, and so it consists of sensory receptors located right in the inner ear canal. Um, and gravity and vibration um, kind of gives in input into those. And there's, um, there's tiny little hairs with um, carbonite crystals, which sounds very, very <laughs> scientific. Um, and it's covered with a fluid called endolymph. So, um, you know, these, these systems are very, very delicate and very finely tuned. And um, even in people, neurotypical people, we all know how disorientating it can kind of be if you get, um, you know, like swimmer's ear or something yeah. like that. It can really, I don't you know if anyone's ever suffered with vertigo, um, mm. it can be really, really horrible and really disorientating. Um, so for people with, um, where their vestibular system is, isn't working correctly, um, it, you know, it can be really, really um, have such an impact on, on the way that they process their environment and, and just kind of being and, mm. and traveling from one place to another. So, um, Often um, people who are hypersensitive, you would see um, they might avoid movement. So they might be labelled as always really lazy, doesn't want to get up, he doesn't want to come and join in with these games. And but actually, um, they might feel really safe and steady and secure where they're sat. Um, they can become dizzy or nauseated quickly. So these are these are not the guys that can spin on a on a yeah. spinning chair for for hours and not appear, appear to, to kind of get dizzy or anything like that. Um, you know, they can often if they if they watch other people doing spinning movements, that can, can make them feel sick. Um, these kind of um, young people are going to have difficulty kind of um, moving their head upside down. And um, so again, PE um, sessions are often where you can see that these um, difficulties become really apparent. And um, often that's where we, we might see behaviour in PE sessions. We might think, um, you know, actually they don't want to join in. It's it's about their kind of motivation, perhaps. But actually, it might be. You know, having some really physical um, impacts on them. Um, so yeah, often these youngsters will have difficulty with um, travel as well. So um, you know, suffer with travel sickness, find tr um, the bus journeys into school really difficult. Will often um, could be distressed on arrival um, quite frequently, and often will just kind of blame it. Oh, he struggles with transitions because he's autistic. You know, but actually sometimes it's worth you know looking a bit a bit more deeply into it and about why. 
Um, so if people are hypo um, vestibular, that's that's your spinners, your your rockers, your twirlers. So um, you know we have one young man who actually every morning um, he will come in and he will spin on on the teacher's spinny chair for a good. 10, 15 minutes, and that's him kind of just getting his system ready for the day. Mm -hmm. um, and we know actually, if we don't allow him the time and opportunity to do that, he's gonna, he's really gonna struggle with it with the, the elements and the much demands that we place on him very early on in the day. Um, and he'll be seeking it through the day. Yeah, and, and that's the other thing. He he will seek it in other ways, um, and and he might have gone to it in, to attempt to spin somewhere and those kind of things. So what we are able to do is preempt that. A, a strategy in place that's accessible for him and as part of his routine um, and then you know fortunately we reap the results of him having that opportunity because he's um, in a better position to be ready to learn and, and attend to tasks and things um, so yeah they can often present and um, we call them like little daredevils and um, little awareness of danger might try and um, sort of climb and jump from things and we've all seen those youngsters that will will and I think some of some of you mentioned it in the chat around the proprioceptors um, issues. They, they're gonna they're gonna find the nearest table or chair and they're gonna jump off it and and they're gonna enjoy that feeling. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and often they'll move lots, but not necessarily in an organised way. Mm -hmm. So you know your your arm twitches, your leg your leg shufflers, and all those kind of things. So um, are some of these familiar behaviours that that people are seeing regularly? I should hopefully they are, um, and hopefully it makes a bit of sense. Um, for both of these systems, there's a wealth of research yeah. and. Um, strategies, it, you know, it really is just a case of, of giving it a Google or having a look on YouTube, which I'm sure will explain it in a far more um, coherent, coherent <laughs> way than, than me. So. Yeah, I, I mean, also, quite interestingly, I mean, if you've got access to something like a swing, that's amazing, um, because actually it's an organised movement of moving forwards and backwards. And actually what research has shown that half an hour on a swing for a vestibular seeker can have a then um, up to nine hours impact later on. So, um, you know, having that input perhaps at the beginning of the day, I mean, if you're in a primary school and lucky enough to have a swing, that's fantastic. Pop them out on the swing for 10, 15 minutes. And then that's kind of the, the input he's got for a decent amount of time. And then you'll, you'll probably pick up when they need to swing again, kind of thing. So, um, so a, lot of the, a lot of the strategies that we're going to talk about um, and ideas aren't, aren't massive. You know, you have to buy specialist equipment or anything like that. Hopefully, there's a lot of things that you've got at hand within your schools um, that you can help support these children, and it won't take masses of time either. Or money. Um, yeah, yeah, because we know budgets are great at the moment. So, um, yeah, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, so, ooh, it's on. Right, it's that word again introspection. Right, um, this is a fairly new area um, in sensory processing, and actually, if you buy books, um, it may not be included in a lot of books because it was only around. 2014, 2015, that really this um, this area has been explored. Um, <clears throat> and actually, it's, it's made a huge amount of sense to us um, as, a, as a setting. Um, and, and it's the system that really is, is how your body feels internally and your organs feel, but also your skin. Um, so for example, I'm a little bit stressed now, so I can feel my neck is quite red um, and quite hot. Um, if, if you don't understand why your neck is hot and red, that can be really disconcerting, or or perhaps if you get prickly heat. Um, so it's it's really the understanding of how your body feels, um, and it can have really serious consequences. I mean, I've had a young lady who um, refused to have a bowel movement because she didn't like the way it felt, um, and actually that caused massive medical issues for her. Um, and she, you know, she was hospitalised all sorts because of it, um, and and that was because she just couldn't understand or process um, how her food moved through her body. Um, so, and, and, and it's got a, a big link towards um, around uh, emotions as well. So, um, for example, if you, you're feeling angry, there's a physiological response that you have to feeling angry. Um, so you might get hot, um, um, you might want to, to move or shout or scream, whatever. Um, if you're a person who, who doesn't understand those phys physiological responses to being angry, and you, you don't associate the two, you often will respond in an incorrect way. So. Uh, for example, we've got a young man who, when he gets angry, he'll strip all his clothes off. Because what he's doing is responding to how his body's feeling. He's not responding, he's not making a connection between, I'm angry, so I probably need to sit and calm down. What he'll do is strip and run. Um, so so that's 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 really where it is. But it's, it's very interesting. And um, unfortunately, there's not a huge amount of um, research or um, information about no, how, how no. to um, support these young people. I mean, there is some ways that we've been thinking about. Um, some of the research does say using things like mindfulness and yoga 
um, would really help and sort of relaxation um, techniques and uh, Liz, you use body time, don't you, in your class? Yeah, so we um, we use something we call, we call it body time, which is just about developing um, body awareness, really. So we use things like, um, and again, it depends on the individual and what other, other things they have, have going on. And it all, as with all of these strategies, and um, the important bit is what you know about the youngster as a person and what you know about them as in terms of what their, their tolerances are. But we use things like... Um, Foot spas and, and massage mm. to um you know to, to talk about different parts of our bodies hand mm. massages we use different kind of um brush body brushes and those kind of things um and it's about kind of learning at a very basic level what these what these parts of our body are and um and how they can feel are they hot are they mm. cold are they slippery are they and all those kind of things so for, I work in the um primary the um autism provision so at that stage we we at that very basic level kind of naming body parts understanding that sometimes they feel differently depending on what what we're doing and that kind of thing and um, and then i think one of the yeah. things we're hoping to develop is almost um you know a sort of almost a scheme of work around it really in terms of what that then looks like at secondary level and then post 16 which is what we would like for our pupils to be able to recognize um you know make the link because ultimately it will impact on their ability to access um, services mm -hmm. and things as, as they move on you know what we what we would really like is is our little chap who who strips as soon as he is gets hot and things um is to perhaps not be doing that at 19 20 because what we know is is the options for him after school will be um limited as a result of that so um but yeah it's a really interesting area and it's something that you know we with hands up we're not um as, as up to, up to date and as um, kind of comfortable and confident with as we are the other -ish, um, yeah, areas. So mm -hmm. it's, it's exciting though, it's mm -hmm. interesting stuff. So. I think if you're from a mainstream setting and you have got children who've got a bit more verbal understanding, um, you can talk about things like um, when your tummy rumbles, when you're feeling hungry, about why that happens and what you do about it to fix it. And another really nice, which we use for behaviour, is a process map. I'm hoping people can see that. Um, hopefully that you can see that on your screen. Um, but it's a really simple way. I mean, and this can be adapted through from primary through to secondary. And um, this is an example of a young person who might get very upset when their tummy rumbles. Um, so actually with their tummy rumbling, it might uh, mean because they don't understand what that sensation is, that you might get difficult or dangerous behavior or just um, irritating behavior or whatever. So, um, so this way, oh, can everybody see that? Sorry, I was just about to say, um, is it on the slides or? I'm just holding it up. I think it's because. Oh, right. You, your video is actually off. Sorry, I, th I thought you'd done that on purpose to save your internet. Okay. Yeah. Oh, no. Okay. If you just mute one of you. Okay, yeah, sorry. Sorry, sorry, just just um could you mute um so because you've got two versions of yourselves. Um if you mute the one that you're presenting from and unmute the one that we can see you on. Sorry, I recognise that's a little bit confusing. Okay, fine. Escape. Unmute. Sorry guys, <laughs> technology. Right, so what am I doing? Just mute your microphone. And then, if, brilliant. And then we should hopefully be able to all see you when you're presenting. Okay. okay. Yeah, we're here. Yes. yes. Oh, now I'm. <laughs> give up. Give up. We'll give up on that. Okay. Let's just stop that. Yeah. We'll send it out. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So, it's slight technical hitch there. There's always one. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And I'm unmuted. Right. Okay. Right, so, um, oh, we'll get the slides back on. Yeah, okay, so um, the process okay. map is an idea really of, of you have a picture, first of all, that is, um, for example, of a picture of a young person holding their tummy because their tummy is rumbling. And you can have a simple sentence under it saying, my tummy is making a noise. And um, then you do a simple arrow, and then the middle picture, you would have a picture of a child eating something. Um, and then another arrow and then um, a picture of a happy child saying tummy is quiet and I feel better. So it's a really simple sort of visual idea um, to show them, OK, this is, this is how you feel. We recognise that completely. And this is what you need to do to make yourself feel better. Um, because, you know, under, 
understanding that perhaps these children don't um, understand how to stop their stomach feeling bad. Um, and you can you can make that more technical if you are working in a secondary setting. So you could get you know go into the whole um, where your food goes and everything else, and, and you know why your body responds in different ways. Um, so depending on the level of, of ability and understanding of the child. But um, as we all know, with autistic kids in particular, um, visual things really work. Um, so sometimes just trying to explain it verbally, it doesn't tend to go in. Whereas if you've got pictures, you can go through it really slowly with them. That does work really well. Um, and so, yeah, and it, it just gives them strategies to be able to um, process um, these feelings. Um, so it might be that you, you, on a routine, share this process map with them on a daily basis. Or it might be that, you know, when you notice that that child is, is feeling uncomfortable and holding their tummy, you show them the process map and go through it with them. Um, so, but I, I will send that through to you. Sorry, I was trying to be too technical by holding things up. That didn't work. Yeah, we were, we were over ambitious. We really were. Okay, right. The next slide. We've got a nice video now, which hopefully will. Oh work. no, the technology. So, right. Do I need to? I can just play it. Can I hope. Yeah. This will explain it better than I can. Everyone, see it okay? Yay. Yeah.
Okay. Right, so hopefully um, that video is on YouTube. So, I mean, if you want to share that with your staff, it's quite a nice short little video that you can, you can show them, um, you know, if you want to share this later on. Right, so um, hopefully um, we've done, oh, we've, possibly, we've kind of um, given enough information about why we need, need sensory profiling, although I imagine a lot of people need that anyway. Um, and so now we will we'll show you how we how we do it. So um, we use a questionnaire from a book called Building Bridges through Sensory Integration. Um, we were hoping to be able to hold the book up, <laughs> but I think that might be technically impossible beyond us. Yeah. Um, again, you'll have the slides which will tell you. So and I've got an example. So if we take this yes, one. Um, so the questionnaires look like this, um, they're really straightforward and the idea is that they're really accessible for both professionals and, and parents. So um, from Building Bridges we've, we've taken and um, they offer a whole um, survey which covers all of the different areas from kind of um, eating, self-care, kind of um, classroom, life in the classroom. Um, social situations and all those kind of things and it is literally just a case of picking which apply and um, so what one of the reasons we like using this one is because um, you don't need a massive in-depth knowledge of kind of um, the scientific terms it is literally um, very easy, easily um, for professionals we mm. most of the time it's our support staff um, that complete these because they spend the most time with the young people they know them really well often um, parents will will contribute as well and interestingly um you will sometimes find different results to different settings so mm. what um a profile for home might look quite different to a profile for school um so it, you, we kind of we go through and we pick and, and ultimately it gives you a tally um under each of the areas of where the, the young person um is likely to have um hyper or hypo sensitivity um or they might have a mix um, profile. Either way, it offers um, you know areas of, that they're likely to have difficulty with, um, and then we look at building in um, strategies to support them. So this um, yeah, we'll just. I'm pretty sure that um, see we've shared we've shared this um, with other schools um, because building bridges are very they're very up for people. Um, yeah, no, it's, well, it's photocopying it, so we yeah. can send it. Um, we can send um, it as a PDF. Um, and we've shared it with other schools as well, so we can perhaps send it to Georgina to, yeah. to pop out. And it will literally just be the questionnaire. I mean, obviously, we would absolutely recommend buying the book because it, it has lots of um, ideas and strategies and things in it. Um, so, yeah, um, once completed that, we, yeah. we tally it up, and that's when we begin to put the profile together. So the questionnaire, um, as Belinda said, is just photocopied from the book, so you don't need to do anything more, which is another big thing, really. Um, so you literally photocopy it. And, and it is straightforward language which again we appreciated because you will in a lot of sensory integration books or sensory processing books they'll have questionnaires like this but what we have found is when um we've had ot's sending us um checklists it reflects very similarly to this one um and ot's recognize this as a really good book it doesn't have introspection in it i'm afraid um because again uh, i think because it's got such a relatively new area um, but it does give you all the other areas and um, send them to parents. I mean, it, it's it's easy language. So things like rub spots where when that are touched. You know, so they're, they're simple little phrases just to tick off. So it doesn't take mountains of time. And um, one thing I, I don't know if I've said, but I will say is obviously we do have an OT service. We have um, a, an excellent lady that supports us. Um, and obviously she she um, oversee. We had the conversation with her about what we were doing. Was she happy with mm. that? Um, and she's obviously very much in support of it because she understands that she's never going to um, be able to, to carry out these profiles for, I think, 143 pupils. Mm -hmm. um, so she's, um, her name's Wendy, and she does mm -hmm. oversee these, if you like, and we check in regularly with her. And of course, if we do have a youngster that is particularly complex or is, you know, displaying um, high levels of self-injurious behaviour, of course, we would be, we would be referring to her, um, you know, as, as a service. Um, and, and for them to access her as a therapist. Yeah, the name of the book, because some people are asking, was Building Bridges Through Sensory Integration. It's, it's the third there. edition. It is on your previous slide as well, um, if that helps. Um, and yeah. Yeah, I think Belinda's adding that into the chat so you know what the name is. Hopefully that's 
Lovely. Okay. Um, so once you've um, compiled your, if we yep. get that. Oh. Um, no, that's fine. That's fine. Um, so this is what our sensory profiles look like. Um, and again, you may be able to see it um, more clearly um, when you have the PowerPoint um, sent to you. So um, what we take is, is the results, if you like, of the survey um, that we carry out, and we put it into a profile. So um, we use um, a, a tool, a sensory toolkit that Heidi developed um, with, uh, what was her name, Geneva? Yeah. Um, the OT that she worked really closely with. So um, it's, it's a big and massive um, document that, that contains kind of strategies for hypo or hyposensitivity in each of the areas. So those um, those kind of strategies, if you if you don't have a bank of strategies, kind of in in terms of your own knowledge and things, um, again, it, it's not rocket science. It's a case of um, either buying one of the books, which are, we referenced on the previous slides, um, which will give you a list, or, or speaking to um, other professionals, those kind of things. Um, I don't think we're in a position to share that toolkit quite as widely um, as as that without contacting Ginny first. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so looking at the profile that's in front of you, this is uh, just an example. So uh, having gone through the questionnaire, um, what you do is tally up and see where the main area of need is. So if you notice that um, there's a lot of ticks in proprioception and hyper responsive. Um, you know that's going to be a main area of need. And what we what we do is then order them on the profile of um, where the biggest difficulties are. And then often you'll have two or three which come up quite high as well. Um, so for this young person, um, auditory hyper has been um, recognised and tactile hyper. Um, so what we do is put in the common behaviours for that individual child. So sensitive to sounds, especially if unpredictable or unfamiliar and finds these distracting, frequently covers ears to block out sound and input. So um, that's that's the sort of behaviour that child is exhibiting quite regularly. From the questionnaire, we know it's auditory hyper. Um, and so the possible sensory activities, as Belinda said, you, you can take from a range of books. And there's some really good ones out there. I mean, Building Bridges, as we mentioned, is brilliant. Um, there's also one called Early Intervention Games, which I absolutely love. Um, and that's, again, on, on the slide, um, previous which is um, referenced there and the lovely thing about this book is it's got um, loads of activities and then in the index area it, it has a uh, vestibular sent visual tactile and then lists the activities under those areas so you could literally say right okay it's vestibular and then pick an activity so there's loads in that one which is brilliant there's also a book um, which we've referenced which is called the out of zinc child has fun um, I love this book again, but um, it, it's quite hard to get hold of now. I know you can get it through Amazon, um, but as I say, there's, there's lots of books coming out all the time. So really you're looking for um, sensory integration books or sensory processing books with activities in them referencing the, the sensory area. So for, for this young person, for auditory, auditory is, is a really hard one to um, to to support really. Um, often you'll see, oh, let's pop up ear defenders on them. Um, mm -hmm. Ear defenders are lovely, but they have to be used well. And often you'll find an over reliance on ear defenders, um, and actually that can cause ear infections and all sorts. Um, um, so, what you're trying to do really with someone who's got auditory sensitivities, who's very sensitive to sound, is um, almost desensitize them through a series of activities. So, yes, use um, ear defenders in busy air times, but limit the time they're wearing them. Because, um, I mean, we have seen in the past, haven't we? in some mainstream settings as well as special settings, uh, kids in ear defenders all the time, um, and then we have difficulties. So these are some examples. So um, exposing them to instruments and allowing them to control the volume um, and gradually increasing it. Um, I mean, I had a young man who wouldn't have any TV on and what we did with him was he slowly controlled the TV. And then, you know, we did almost a working for system of how long he could, he could tolerate it. And that really worked. Um, but yeah, use of headphones, earmuffs, ear defenders for limited time and seeing if that does make a difference. We're not saying don't use them because they are great resources, but just don't become over reliant on just one, one thing. Um, and his second area was tactile. Um, so this young man had difficulty with messy activities um, <clears throat> and was really struggling to touch any anything messy or wet. Um, and that also had an issue around him as eating because he wouldn't eat anything that was messy or sloppy. Um, so again, exposure to messy play on his terms. The, the jo joy of using gloves is that's really good for kids who don't like any, any sort of mess on their hands. Um, if you give them just sort of, um, you know, the plastic gloves, 
then they've got some protection they can just take the gloves off um but again it's just exposure slow exposure but giving them them power to be able to stop it whenever they want to um and also uh, using things like um fine motor control activities because it may be although i've put this down as tactile it might be a proprioceptive issue as well that actually they don't understand about pressure um, so actually a slimy activity might be quite scary because you don't know how much pressure to use with that slimy thing. So you think of something like corn flour, that's really quite complex, isn't it, when it's wet? Um, so yeah, so using fine motor control activities, so they're more aware of where the, what their fingers feel like and, and um, how things feel. Um, and again, it's that slow exposure. Um, okay, so, so really that's what um, a profile looks like. Does that make sense to everyone before we move on? And so just a couple of things, um, one of the things these can be really, so we don't just make the profile and it sits there forever um, in a folder somewhere. So um, we expect our staff, if, if the young person has a sensory profile, we expect when we visit the classroom or, or if we're doing lesson observations, we expect, um, you know, some evidence that they're meeting these needs within educational activities. Um, so again, um, like for example, for this young person, um, one of the an art lesson for them might actually look like tolerating different materials whilst wearing a pair of gloves and, and what the sensory profile um offers us is is almost a, um a justification if you like so if somebody visits the classroom and oh, well how come everyone else is you know painting these beautiful self-portraits and a little um i don't know dean in the, in the corner there is actually just mucking about with a with a tray full of material well actually this this is why he's doing that because um for him this is this is the out this is the important outcome and this this act, learning activity is one of the ways in which we can meet his sensory needs oh that looks lovely um it's also useful um for when we're looking at ehcp outcomes and things obviously um it can be really useful to identify targets for the individual um because when you get that dreaded question of what are you doing to meet their sensory needs and you have um, no ot support um it's a way of filling that gap yes so mm. we can um and, and often um these are really useful for things like um our parent support advisor uses them quite a lot um when she's doing things like applications for grants and all those kind of things because what we're saying is actually this this young person has an, an identified need and these these work alongside our things like your risk management plans your behavior plans and all that kind of thing because actually again you know it, Certainly with our behaviour plans, the most important bit is kind of what are the things you're doing um, you've got in place before it reaches its crisis point. And, and we would expect, for, and we have for the majority of our young people um, that display difficult and dangerous behaviour, um, we have, um, you know, what we will have in that plan is that they have a sensory profile and access to sensory support as part of their curriculum. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a given, if you like, that they would have access to those kind of things. Um, okay yeah okay and what we would say is this is a working document so um uh, if you have given this to your staff or you put the, the profile together with your staff and you realize that actually you've tried one of these activities several times and the child hates it just take it off you know and look for another one so they should be working documents um and uh, you know we always encourage our staff to, to write all over them and saying you know i've tried it on this day it was disastrous or he loved this activity so we'll make sure that's part of his diet um, so yeah, just um, use them as working documents and, and don't feel that you have to stick with the possible activities on there. Um, there's loads of stuff out there, even though some of them might be a bit weird. Yeah, um, yeah so we should say often um, the strategies um, are referred to as the sensory diet. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and, and again, that, that goes, the books go into more detail about what a diet should look like, how often. Um, but for us, um, in terms of being accessible, practical, and, and eat, we just, this is, this is how we use it um, for our youngsters in, in the classroom. OK, um, so sensory uh, sessions, um, I'm sure a lot of you would have heard of sensory circuits. Um, uh, they use quite widely now, which is brilliant. Um, um, so you could use this within a sensory circuit or you could use it on a one to one level or on a group. Um, so perhaps you've got one or two children who've got a very similar profile. Um, so you could do it as a group activity. Um, we're not going to limit you, but what we would say is that um, with the sensory circuit, um, with this any sensory session, following this structure really helps. Um, because I made the mistake when this was really quite new of um, doing these lovely sensory activities and returning the child to the class in a really hyper state. 
uh, without doing the calming bit at the end, which was a big mistake. Um, so this is the recognised structure, and, and you'll see this in a lot of books. So it starts off with an alerting activity, um, and your sensory circuits will probably run in a similar way. Um, so that's really just to wake up your system. Um, so it might be just running around the field for a bit, or bouncing on a physio ball for a bit, or on a trampoline. Um, so just waking things up. And then the organising bit is the bit from your profile. Um, so if you are doing one-to-one -one sessions or individual sessions, that's the bit where you might be, uh, if you've got a child with proprioceptive issues, that you're doing balancing activities or, or something that actually requires um, them to meet that need on their profile. And then that's followed by the calming session. And that could be simply laying on the floor for a few minutes, listening to some music and doing some hand massage, something like that, just to calm, calm them down before returning to the classroom. Um, and you'll find that with sensory circuits, I think we said we call it, is it bounce, bounce, balance and squash is, is yeah. kind of what, our, what we go to. So, and, it, um, and the reason we call that is because um, you can do, you can do a whole sensory session, as I'm sure people are with mm. limited resources, you can do a whole sensory circuit with a gym ball. Yeah. Um, and, and often when we go into mainstream schools, um, you know, quite rightly so, there are concerns around lack of space, lack of resources. Mm. Um, and those kind of things. So it's about um, it being simple and accessible. And actually, you can bounce on a gym ball. You can roll on your tummy over a gym ball and balance. Um, and then you can perhaps do some squash, squash the young person with a gym <laughs> ball, which always sounds a bit odd if you don't um, use that kind of approach regularly. But you know, you can apply some deep pressure um, to their back or, or the backs of their legs whilst they're laying down. And again. Um, you know, think gym balls are, we've, we've got them all over the school and they pop up um, at all times of the day. And because you can actually just have a young person doing their bounce, their balance and their squash, um, you know, maybe while everybody else is, is doing circle time and then they'll just join um, for the end because for them that's far more important the um, than the register because yeah. it actually it puts them in the best position to learn. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Now, tracking and recording. Um, this has always been a bit of a difficult area um, because ideally what we want to move towards um, with using the sensory profile and using sensory sessions is that the child is able to recognise when they need to access that sensory resource or sensory input. Um, so that's the end game, if you, so to speak. So um, what ideally you want is if a young person is really, really upset, they know, OK, if I go and bounce on that physio ball for a few minutes, I'm going to calm myself down rather than wrecking the classroom. That's essentially it. Um, so the sensory sessions, although um, we will we'll never say how frequently you need to do them or um, the fact that they must be done at these certain times of the day. Um, again, it depends on your individual. But those sessions are teaching that the young person that, OK, you, when you feel this way, this feels really nice. It calms you down. Um, so hopefully, um, for example, with the gym ball idea, um, the gym ball might be kept in the, in the class cupboard. Um, so ideally what you want is for the child to then start to ask to use the gym ball for a few minutes. Um, and actually they're then doing their own sensory pro sensory session themselves. They're, they're, they're asking for it and, and accessing it. So that's where we want to get to. Um, but recording and, um, and in, sort of proving impact has always been a bit of a tricky one, which we are looking at. Um, observations are really, really important um, for Oh yes, yeah. Oh yeah, actually, yeah. Sorry. Um, observations are really important um, before putting the profile together and um, while you're doing the sessions. Um, so actually, if you ha are able just to sit back and watch the child and see exactly what they're doing, um, and also, as I said, with the profile, it is a working document. So if you observe, actually, that child is not enjoying the activity, make a note of it and don't do it again, or, or try it again in a different way or whatever. So, um, so again, that's reviewing the profile. Uh, recording the sessions is really interesting. I hate video recording myself, so I'm quite glad people can't see this right now. Um, but actually, once you video record yourself, you can actually see um, bits that perhaps you miss in the session because you're so involved with the session you might not notice um, some facial expressions or some body movements or whatever. Um, um, so video them and, and sit as a team and, and watch it back and say, oh, perhaps what, what we, was he reaching for something else that would have been more appealing or um, whatever. So uh, this is um, a form that we I have created. To be completely honest, we haven't used it a huge amount because I think it's still too complicated at the moment. Yeah. Um, so we are looking at how we, we do record these sessions. Um, but it's just an idea. I, what I wanted to do was prove impact of the session. 
Um, so at the top, obviously, you can see uh, the, the state of the, the child's in before the session. So it might be that through from calm to being distracted. Um, and then I've left boxes for alerting, organising and calming. So whoever's um, doing the session, whatever adult is doing the session, just um, writes in what they've done in each of those areas and then records at the end of the session if there's been a change of behaviour or a change of um, uh, regulation, really. Um, and then at the bottom also it says uh, how long were they able to focus on the task, for example. So, I mean, that's another way of perhaps tracking that perhaps he sat on the, bounced on the physio ball for two minutes the first session and then five for the next. Um, it's just trying to get that way of, of tracking of how, how, how much these, these activities are impacting the child. What the difficulty is with sensory um, processing, sensory um, uh, integration or, or profiles or whatever, is that sometimes the impact can happen later. So it might be that before the session, the child is quite distracted and at the end of the session, the child's quite distracted, but it takes a little while for the input to kick in. Um, so again, observations through the day might be good, but um, Belinda's kindly doing a whole project of work on that now, aren't you? So I'm sure she'll be able to share with you her, her excellence. Well, she's no doubt. No yeah. doubt. <laughs> um, but you know, it is an area, like we recognise that we didn't have, you know, we didn't have real clear systems in place to address the sensory needs, we now acknowledge that what we don't have is a clear systems in place to measure impact. So that's something mm. as a school that we're, we're, we're focusing on. And again, if anybody, um, you know, has something similar that they use, we'd be really grateful um, if you could share. It would be really useful. And steal your um, ideas. Yeah, we're all up for stealing ideas. It's, <laughs> it's, you know, it's brilliant, isn't it? Mm. So um, that kind of brings us to the end of, of our um, session. I think the challenge has been not being able to kind of show you a full questionnaire um, in front of mm. you and to demonstrate the toolkit. Um, so we'll look at getting those those sent through, really. Um, but yeah, does anybody have any questions um, in relation to what we've presented that we, might, we may or may not be able to answer? We're happy to try. Yep, sorry, there's just a question here. Yeah, it was the out of zinc child has fun. Um, uh, activities for children, kids with sensory processing disorder and again it is on one of the slides that's referenced so um, yeah once you get the slides through you'll be able to, to get yeah. the reference off that. Um, thank you for the, um, uh, is it Brigitte, thank you for sharing um, another useful book, it's always good um, as we come across things to find out. There was one question that came up earlier from Inbar um, who asked, uh, I have a number of pupils who love heights and love jumping from them. What would you recommend? I don't know if you've got any recommendations for that. Yeah, it, it depends on what kind of setting you're in. If you're in a primary school setting, um, what we have done, I mean, in, in our classrooms, is actually have a, a horse, one of those PE horses within the room. Um, so it's an appropriate place to climb on or having some climbing activities um, available, but only accessing them at specific times. Because obviously you don't want the children jumping all over the tables uh, constantly, which they will do if they are um, height seekers. Um, but yeah, it's it's um, it's with those sort of kids, it's, it's teaching them what's appropriate and when, um, but not because we've acknowledged that actually they're seeking heights, which um, they will continue to do. Um, and what we would say is if you don't give those children opportunities to do things like that, then the behaviour will manifest in different ways. And often that might be worse. Um, I mean, an example being I had, um, you can use an example of a young person who flaps constantly that I know that child was stopped from flapping and then they started to head bang. So it's just being aware that um, although climbing is a really difficult one, making sure they have access to that at appropriate times is really important. Oh uh, yes, yeah, so you've mentioned, um, yeah, obviously that's going to be really, really worrying for parents. And again, it depends mm. on the, um, the level of ability of the child. So if they have any kind of um, verbal understanding, things like a social story alongside the opportunity to do that in a safe and appropriate way. Um, so we might, um, again, it depends on the individual, but we might, um, we want our young people to, okay, these are safe things, safe ways to climb and safe places to climb, and these are dangerous places to climb. So what you might do is um, do your social study um, where they, they tell you where safe and things, and one of those safe places to climb might be the horse or um, the step, whatever you're using, um, and then they, you then have, they would have access to that for a period of time. Um, and then you might repeat the social story afterwards, just to remind them of expectations. But it is 
says really difficult um, and, and the feedback that they're going to get is, is really good feedback so it's really hard to replace that um, or to replicate it and, and as I say um, it might, and in that case, you know, obviously you've recognised um, they're seeking high questionnaire to be really useful to see, yeah. okay, why is it, is it a proprioceptive thing, is it a visual thing? Sometimes mm. um, visual seekers can enjoy, um, you know, the, the way the light show. look and the light show from um, jumping and, and those kind of things. So that might offer, you know, further strategies, but um, often we will... We will seek to, um, if something's socially unacceptable or dangerous, you're looking at replicating it in a safer way, not completely saying, well, no, they absolutely just can't do mm. that, um, because that, that's not fair, is it? Um, um, but a visual sorting activity might be good. So, I mean, as Belinda said, we use the word safe and dangerous all the time with our kids. So um, it might be a sorting activities of pictures, if they're at a le level that's non-verbal, for example. So sorting pictures of, safe things to climb on and dangerous things to climb on and, and doing activities like that just to try and en enable that understanding. Um, but yeah, Belinda's completely right. I mean, it, it's trying to find things that are acceptable, which are safe and socially acceptable is a big one. Um, I mean, for example, a, a one which is really difficult is spitters, spitters and kids who like playing with their own bodily fluids in the nicest possible way. Um, and there's, a, for example, we had one child who did that and um, we replaced that with um, one of those glitter tubes that, you know, you turn over and watch because from their profile, we realised it actually wasn't a tactile thing they were seeking. It was the visual um, because what they did was hold their saliva in front of their own eyes and watch it dribble down. So that's the effect they were after. So actually using a glitter tube was um, much easier for parents when they're going on the bus or train uh, to hold a glitter tube than being sticking on the window. Um, so it's that sort of thing. But hopefully the profiles will be able to help you unpick some of that. Um, yeah, just looking at some of the questions, um, you're absolutely right, is it, um, Irian? Um, you know, sensory processing um, is um, prevalent in, in youngsters with all different mm. kinds of, um, you know, issues and diagnoses. What my advice would be, do a sensory profile, but they yeah. don't have to have autism to, to have a sensory profile yeah. um, be useful for them. I mean, we used it because we recognised it in that particular cohort of people, there was a real need. So mm. um, for us, that's kind of where we started in our ISD provision and then looked at um, cascading it out to um, other other um, teachers and other um, settings. But I, I mean, it's always worth doing one. Um, in terms of the risk assessment, um, when we introduce equipment, that would come down to, you know, depending on your setting. Um, for us, we, we didn't have a specific risk, risk assessment because, um, you know, we had the, the child's risk assessment. Um, so in his you know, behaviour, um, difficult behaviour would be seeking furniture to jump on. So the strategy we put in to address that um, would be supervised access to the um, horse, as we, you know, the PE horse. Um, there was a mat underneath it. Um, and other pupils um, weren't able to have access to it. So it depends on your setting. I mean, our head was happy, mm. happy with that. Um, it might be that it might be more appropriate to use a, a safer area. So, you know, if you have a, a PE area, if you like, and it's, and it's easier to take the young person there um, to have access to, to equipment, particularly if you're in a mainstream, busy um, primary setting, it's going to be tricky to get. So you don't have 30 youngsters jumping off the dim horse, you know. Um. Um, and what I would say is there is some specialist equipment, which is amazing, um, but I would seek some support when using it. So you you may have heard of things like hug jackets um, and weighted blankets. And um, there's quite a specific way of using those those um, uh, uh, those bits of equipment safely. Um, so, for for example, the weighted blanket, um, you need to take into account the size and weight of the child um, that you're using it with, and the fact that they're supervised. And um, and yeah, so just just be aware that there are safety issues around some of the equipment. Things like the um, the hug jacket and weighted blanket shouldn't be used for any longer than half an hour at a time because otherwise it, it just doesn't work, and also it's not good for the child. So, um, for those sort of specialist equipment, I would ask um, your OT if you have got any access to an OT for support around because they can be really beneficial particularly for those real pressure seekers um, um, and also I mean we do use something called deep deep um, uh, deep oh, I've lost the words deep pressure massage um, and joint compressions which sounds awful but it's um, to do with uh, uh, work sort of massaging your joints um, again there's quite a lot around there of, of being aware of kids who are um, have got hyper flexibility 
um, and have a, other conditions. So if you were going to use deep pressure or any um, specialist things like the joint compressions, uh, get your OT support. It's simple training. You know, I think um, our OT just spent 20 yeah, minutes. Yeah, 20 minutes is going through some safety and some um, mm. guidelines. Um, sorry, there was uh, Carmen's. Um, in terms of lighting, it depends, you know, if you're looking at adjusting and lighting it, I know, so I'm aware I keep saying, but it depends mm. on the individual. Um, if, 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 you know, if the profile says they're hypersensitive to lighting, sometimes it can just be about where they sit in the classroom. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you might not be sitting them, obviously, right next to a window, or they might have access. Um, some of our young people um, find having access to sunglasses. Um, you know, um, you might put them, um, if they've got, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I mean, um, as far as if you've got a young person with light sensitivity or, um, Putting the person with um, autism or with sensory processing at the front of the class, at the furthest um, uh, distance away from the door, um, but also think about lights and particularly blinds because they can be incredibly distracting. Um, so, what, what we would is, uh, advise is have a think about where you are setting them at the front of the class because you don't want it to be, to be too combative. So, um, you know, if it's just it's at the front of the class but one row back kind of thing, that would be fine. But just be aware of, of sit where that child sits. And look around and see okay if i'm light sensitive what's going to be really affecting me it may be that you can turn the strip lights off just above that child you know so it's, it's little little things like that but the profile again will really help because you'll be able to note down some of those observations of i notice when he goes to the sports hall for example where the lights are quite bright he's covering his eyes and um, he doesn't do that in the in the classroom you know it's these little observations like that which could be so powerful um, I think it's also important to acknowledge that, um, you know, in terms of, of course, we, you know, we recognise there's a need, we look at putting strategies in place, but we also have to kind of acknowledge the reality is, um, as a society, it's, it, we're relatively unforgiving, you know, so it's about equipping these young people um, with strategies as they move into adulthood to, to kind of manage their sensitivities and recognise them um, and access support, you know, we, you can't expect supermarkets and cafes to turn all their lights off because yeah. this, this yeah. young person's visiting on that particular it's that balance isn't it between kind of that understanding and acknowledging and supporting and you know the harsh reality that is the big wide world so when we look at um particularly with our post-16 autism provision um you know we're looking at, at strategies that um, are going to be transferable across settings socially acceptable um and you know and helping the young person to recognize that need so actually um you know they might recognize that they're feeling really uncomfortable they're feeling really hot um but what they do in response to that is maybe um ask to go home or ask to go back to the base or whatever rather than in that situation stripping off and things so mm. what we would want is that when we're out and about in the community we would want um mitchell to be able to say it's too noisy i don't like it um, I need my ear defenders. If it's still too noisy, I need to go back. I need to go back to class because what what you often see if you don't teach those strategies and those coping mechanisms um, is the explosive um, behaviour, the dangerous behaviour, and the socially unacceptable behaviour. But and there is there is some simple things um, that that are socially acceptable that you can use. So for for example, with the light sensitivity one, um, putting on some sunglasses. I mean that might might help or, or even wearing a, a, a hat with a cap with the front so it covers the sun you know um those sort of things um it doesn't make the child stand out as well as oh or no he needs um sort of massive interventions but actually those things might um just support them but again it's that's why these sensory profiles are so good is because they are working on desensitization as well as offering support mechanisms um so it kind of covers both bases um and i know a young man who um, whenever he goes out wears um a hat but underneath it he's got like a band tied around his head because it gives him pressure around his head because his body awareness is so poor and that way he can keep his head up because he'll, otherwise he's constantly looking at the floor so it's, there's little strategies to try um, but again as Belinda say keeping that kind of social acceptable um, idea in your head at the same time of what what is this going to look like for a 16 year old boy who may be six at the time but um, are these going to be transferable? Um, there was one uh, Chris um, Lambert, how can you tell whether a child's refusing um, or, or, you know, where he's choosing to refuse to do a task essentially or if it's due to a sensory processing concern? Um, often, you know, my, firstly, if, we, if you do um, the questionnaire, and it should be able to give you, um, because it looks at lots of different situations mm. and lots of different um, 
kind of uh, context that would should be able to highlight um, whether it is a genuine, you know, it is genuinely a, a sensory issue or if it is a more of a behavioural yeah. issue. And I think that um, that consistency in context is a massive one. So you know, if you've got a child who is always refusing to touch wet stuff, that's probably a sensory sensitivity. If he's choosing to touch wet stuff in a particular activity, but generally otherwise he's absolutely fine, that's probably choosing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just again. Um, doing those those questionnaires does really help, but it's the consistency and um, and context. But being aware that sometimes those fluctuations do happen, so it may be. Um, but they, they, I think if a child was a sensory to touching things, and um, they would always always be slightly reluctant. So it may be some days you might be able to go, come on, you know, and they'll actually do it. Um, but they'll still look uncomfortable doing it if that makes sense. Fantastic. Thank you so much both. I think we're going to have to wrap things up there. Um, that's been really, really helpful. I think there's some fantastic practical strategies that people have taken on board there. Lots of positive comments in the chat as well. So thank you so much for, for answering those questions and providing such, a, such an engaging presentation. That's been absolutely brilliant. Um, just for those of you um, just having a look at the chat now, I have just put a few links in just quickly. If you just scroll up slightly, I can put them in again in a second. Um, the first one is a link to our past and future virtual leadership development sessions. So as I said, this one will be recorded or has been recorded and will be put on our website. Um, do you have a look at that link and, and see if there's any other ones that you would like to have a look at or indeed any others that you want to sign up to? Um, we do have one on Friday, which is focusing around diversity in the curriculum, which is obviously very topical at the moment. Um, so I'd really recommend that. Um, I have also put in a link for a feedback form. I'd be really grateful if you could fill that in. Um, I'll send that around via email as well. So don't worry if you can't click on that now. Um, and I have also put my email address there as well if you do have any follow up questions. Um, Heidi and Belinda, I think you very kindly said that you wouldn't mind putting your email addresses in the chat as well in case people do have any follow up questions. If you wouldn't mind doing that, that would be really, really helpful. Thank you. Um, so what I wanted to do just very, very quickly is I'm just going to quickly present one more time and then we'll wrap up in about two minutes. Um, oh, sorry, bear with me. Maybe it's not going to work. Sorry. There we go. Um, so I just wanted to very quickly just kind of sum up on what we're doing at the moment at Challenge Partners um, in order to kind of support our schools during this very challenging time. Um, so those of you that are partners, you should be aware that our partnership year has moved back to September. Um, so if you haven't yet renewed or if you're a new school and you're looking to renew, then you do still have time to do that. Um, during this time, we are really encouraging schools to get in touch with their local area hubs and then share and collaborate as much as possible. Um, and we do have lots of resources and things on our website as well, which I'd really recommend you having a look at if you do get a chance. Um, on there, we've got all of our leadership development sessions, which I've shared in the chat. Um, we've also got some fantastic webinars as well. We've got one from the Behavioural Insights team and we've got one uh, from Mark Rowland talking about disadvantaged pupils as well. So there's some really interesting things there. Um, so just following on from this, there is my email address if you haven't seen it in the chat already. So please do drop me a line with any questions at all. Um, I can see that Belinda has put her email address in the chat as well. So, you know, do follow up with any questions. Um, as I said, I will send a follow up email with um, the slides in a PDF format and various useful links and things as well. So do keep an eye out for that. Um, and thank you so much for joining. Um, as I said at the beginning, we are, for those of you who are not partners and um, will be interested in joining the East Coast Hub, so that's around Norfolk, Suffolk Way, um, please do um, join us for our thir a quick 30 minute introduction to the hub. Um, what I recommend is if we have a five minute comfort break and reconvene here at um, 11.35, so in five minutes or so, um, just for those that are interested. Um, but the rest of you, thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much to Heidi and Belinda, because that was a really, really fantastic presentation. Um, loads of practical tips. Um, thank you very much.